If the image of the royal family is becoming a pressing problem for the Queen, it's not by any means the only one. She's been up against political pressures too, like the crisis in Fiji, tensions in French Canada and so on, which we'll be discussing in a moment. But first we consider where she can go at times like this to get away from it all for a bit of peace and contemplation. Actress Virginia McKenna, star of so many films, has a surprising answer. Yes, what I think a lot of people don't know is that um, the Queen has only to go a few steps from the palace and she can enter quite a different world, the world of the Queen's garden. The garden is about 30 acres in size, which is absolutely enormous. That's staggering. I have no it? idea. No, yeah. and it's not just the formal garden, which we see from photographs when they have the garden parties. There are much wilder areas. There's a wonderful lake where there are flamingos. Um, and when the film was being made, there's a heron that comes down. Um, there are all sorts of wild animals little wild animals, squirrels and uh, spiders and all sorts of things that live in the garden. And of course she walks there daily when she's in London with her dogs every morning and feeds the ducks. And it is a real place of contemplation, as you said, and, and silence and a place to, to sort of get one's thoughts together. You mentioned the film, that's the, the film uh, The Queen's Garden, mm. which is available also now on a video cassette. And so you have the privilege of having been actually in the garden. Yes, I did go in the garden. I was very fortunate because there was one, there's one scene in the film where the Queen walks in her rose garden. And uh, because the camera team, my husband Bill Travers, who co-produced it, didn't want to ask the Queen to actually walk and find her marks for the camera, um, he asked me if I would go and be the Queen's stand-in. So I was absolutely over the moon. And um, so I went in, we all went in very early in the morning and the camera set up and we marked various places they were going to ask the Queen to stop and maybe have a discussion with the gardener or just look round her or do whatever. And so I did that and then the Queen came out and um, Bill said to her, oh, Mom, would you like a rehearsal? Oh, no, she said, no, just let's do it. And she was just shown where the marks were, where they wanted her to stop. And she did it first time absolutely perfectly, totally naturally and in fact added a lot of her own little things to it which brought the whole scene to life. So th that was obviously a very natural thing for her, her wandering around her garden mm. and her stopping talking to people and looking at her flowers. Mm. She takes a great deal of interest in it. I think she does take a great interest in the garden. I, I always feel myself that the Queen is a, a country person at heart. I think she loves flowers and loves trees and loves the earth and loves and it takes a very sort of personal interest in what goes on. I know that the gardener at the time, he's now retired, called Fred Nutbeam, um, she quite naturally stopped and talked to him about various roses that were growing and asked his advice and, and they went back to him again when we thought the conversation had ended. She takes a very personal and deep interest in all the life in the garden. There were many wonderful moments in that film, I remember it, but I think the most enchanting for me was the sequence of the policeman showing the ducks, guiding the ducks across the oh, street. Yes. That I thought was so amusing. I think let's just sort of pause and, and have a look at it. But their return is a hazardous undertaking, even under the protective eye of the law. He has all that authority, stopping the traffic, and yet obviously a very sympathetic man and oh, a lover yes. of ducks. I want—is he still—is he still doing that? Is he still in the in the garden? No, um, PC Edward Chicken, who that is Edward the, Chicken. Edward Chicken, that is the policeman you saw. He actually is the most wonderful painter, and um, as a hobby and a pastime, while he was a policeman at the palace, which he was for many many years, he used to go home every evening and paint his bird pictures. And um, we got to hear about this, and we saw some of his paintings. And my husband, Bill, bought me the first mammal 
that piece of chicken ever painted, which is this absolutely exquisite little red squirrel. Oh, it's wonderful. The detail is extraordinary. Isn't it? He, he paints, well, he still does paint a lot, of course, although he's now retired. He probably has more time for painting now, with a brush that only has about two or three hairs on it. And this was his first mammal. The Queen, when she heard about his work, um, was very, very interested in it and loved his work so much that, in fact, she bought five of his pictures, three for herself and two for Prince Philip, I understand. And um, PC Chicken, now retired, lives in the West Country and I think is still painting and is a very, very successful artist and sells all his paintings on the first day of his exhibitions, usually. And is, is he painting wildlife now? or He paints wildlife. Yes, he does other mammals now. I've got a lovely little drawing of his of two harvest mice. And uh, he's just exquisite, very, very small, but perfectly detailed paintings and did drawings. Did he paint many things, do you think, that actually from the Queen's Garden? Oh, yes, I think he did. But despite the tranquility of the Buckingham Palace Garden, the Queen's pressing political and constitutional problems won't go away. What kind of power does she really have to influence decision-making as not only the Queen of Britain, but head of the Commonwealth too? Michael Barrett is joined now by the much-travelled doyen of British Commonwealth correspondents, Patrick Keatley. Patrick, what did the recent Fijian crisis tell us about the Queen's power? Well, it's very considerable. Of course, she has not got tanks and regiments. And the military man who took power in the coup in Fiji, of course, nothing could stop him. But the Queen's approval is extremely important. She did not give it the first time this man, Colonel Rambuka, staged a coup. And that shook him, and he pulled back. And it was some months before he found the courage to stage the second coup. She withdrew her approval entirely. And that has made this a very shaky regime in Fiji, which I think will add to its problems. I don't think the Colonel anticipated that. When she did withdraw that approval, as publicly as she did, mm. was that on the advice of Downing Street or of other Commonwealth Prime Ministers, or did she do it off her own bat? Oh, she did it in her capacity as head of the Commonwealth. And she has uh, a great range of advisers. I've stumbled across them in Oxford and Cambridge and other places. I think there's about 24 people that uh, her advisers can phone up to these real constitutional experts. So she, she's very sure-footed. But the paradox is, surely, that she's head of the Commonwealth in Fiji. She's paramount chief, for goodness sake. That's right. And yet, didn't it all prove she has actually no power at all? Well, you see, she acts on the advice of her Governor-General, where there's uh, a monarchy, as in Fiji. And when the Governor-General finally began to buckle, uh, a very quiet message was sent backstage from Buckingham Palace to him, saying, please resign. In effect, she ticked him off, he was removed from office, and she withdrew from the whole scene. Now, in Fiji, so the only country in the world I know where you see the Queen's picture and the Duke of Edinburgh, and they have uh, on all the walls, and they have public holidays for both birthdays. Now, if all of that is swept away, Colonel Rambuka is in trouble. Furthermore, the Queen has made it known that she doesn't like a racist regime, and that's what he's been setting up. When she went to Canada, to French Canada, a lot of controversy mm. over that, mm. would she there take the advice of Downing Street, of Mrs Thatcher, as whether to go or not? Uh, in fact, no. Entirely in a matter of consulting her Governor-General in Ottawa. Uh, incidentally, the Canadians have recently had a woman as Governor-General, so uh, I dare say it was heart to heart. But when Downing Street, number 10, has tried to step in and advise about trips to Canada, they've been ticked off pretty sharply. Has that always been her relationship with... I mean, Mrs Thatcher's a hard lady. Yeah. Uh, two tough ladies mm. at the top in different ways. What That's is their relationship? Oh, I think abrasive. Confrontation. It started right away in 1979 when Mrs Thatcher was swept into power and became Prime Minister. And very shortly afterwards, the, there was to be a Commonwealth summit, which took place in Zambia in Southern Africa. And uh, the Queen expected to go as head of the Commonwealth. <laughs> Lo and behold, Mrs Thatcher decided she didn't want that. Nobody to this day knows exactly why. But uh, first there were leaks, and bits appeared in papers, then a private message from Mrs Thatcher saying to the Queen, you should not go. And finally, a public one. That's where the Queen really dug her feet in. And there was a very solid session, I know, of senior advisers. And the Queen then issued a statement, which came out. It was, I, I've got it in the files. It's just a, a single sentence. The Queen has noted the advice which has been given to her from various quarters. But she considers the summit in Africa so important that she should be there 
and it is her firm intention to go. And after that, there was silence from Mrs. Thatcher. Yeah, that must have rocked her back in her heels. The Queen well, saying, I'm the boss around here. I know. The Queen says that she makes her own decisions on a lot of things, as she does in her annual Christmas broadcast to the world. She writes it in her own hand. I've checked that at the palace. And uh, she does not check it with number 10. But do we know how Mrs. Thatcher has actually reacted to this toughness? Well, some say that uh, she got her own back by going to the Queen's dressmaker and having an overcoat and a long blue dress made up in the Queen's blue colour. But there's no love lost between those two ladies. One last point to you. When the Queen is on tour, you've often been with her. Yes. Have you felt that she really does love her Commonwealth, care about it? <laughs> she will go to enormous lengths. In Zambia, for example, in southern Africa, uh, there's a youth training centre which was supposed to be ready for her to uh, you know, pull the flag and open it. It wasn't ready. Uh, and even the approach road wasn't ready. And the Queen just chuckled when we all drew up this great convoy of vehicles. She signaled to us all, down we get, and across the bush we went for about oh, 100 yards. By the time we arrived uh, at the scene, uh, we were just covered in that red dust. And the Queen looked down at her white shoes, which had turned pink, and laughed. And then they, they did it all with tremendous spirit. And this is a lady who will do that. She'll go the extra mile time and again. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's put the serious matters of constitutional rule aside now in favour of some regal glamour. It was much in evidence when the Crown Jewellers' Garrard in London's Regent Street gave us an exclusive view of rehearsals for a sparkling charity show to entertain the Princess of Wales. The outfits were all from Diana's regular designers. is by Rifat Osbeck, renowned for his decorative gold applique. These beautiful evening gowns are designed by Murray Arbide, heavily featuring blacks and luscious purples. collection for the Chelsea Design Company, showing the modern puffball in this season's new short-length skirt. This magnificent collection of black evening dresses are designed by Victor Edelstein. Sassoon gives us another look at the shorter length along with his sumptuous evening gowns. of russet gowns from actress turned designer Anushka Hempel. We were able to have a close look at the jewellery too. Emeralds and diamonds mounted in 18 carat yellow gold. Rubies and diamonds worth over half a million pounds. Parve set diamond knot necklace mounted in 18 carat white gold worth 193,000 pounds sterling with matching bracelet at a mere 89,500 pounds. A gray and white pearl cluster and drop necklace 
mounted in 18 carat yellow gold, and a drop pearl and diamond collet tiara, valued at 100,000 pounds. It was all in aid of the Princess of Wales' favorite charity, Birthright, devoted to the health of mothers and babies. Tickets to watch the parade cost a mere 500 pounds a head, and no doubt everybody thought it good value, if only to get a glimpse of the evening's real star, Diana herself. Susie Menkes was there too. Diana swept into Garrard looking like a queen. She looked rather like Queen Elizabeth I, with this great ruff round her neck and her hair swept up and this fantastic cross, an enormous one, hanging on a long chain. When I first saw Diana wearing that amethyst cross, I thought it must be Queen Alexandra's, because Queen Alexandra often wore quite a simple cross, but a very bold one, on long pearl chains in just the same way. And in fact, I think Diana might have got the idea from there, because Queen Alexandra also once dressed up in fancy dress as Elizabeth I. But that cross, Diana, in fact, acquired especially for the occasion. And it's certainly a new departure for Diana, a new regal look, really quite removed from the idea of wearing her jewels as though they were paste. It seems as though Diana, and also the Duchess of York, are going for this Elizabethan style now. Just a few days after Diana appeared at Garrard in that ruff, we saw Fergie in the same idea with a big white Tudor collar. We know those two girls are in competition, so I'm waiting to see whether Fergie now will start wearing a cross. This cross that Diana was wearing is worth about 150,000 pounds, quite a lot of money, we might all think, but the Saudi suite of sapphires is worth two million, and I would price the uh, suite she wore in Germany, given to her by the Sultan of Oman, as at least a million pounds worth of jewels there. The Saudi suite of jewels was really quite extraordinary. First of all, it came in a box, a green box with gold palm trees on the front. And Diana, apparently, when she first saw it, she gasped and said, I don't even know this man, and he's given me all these jewels. There was this enormous sapphire necklace, very showy earrings, a huge ring, and a bracelet, a bracelet with a watch set into it as well. So it's the watch, really, that, and the ring that she didn't decide to wear. And so she had the... Uh, sapphires in the watch made into a choker and she took the sapphire that's in the center of the ring and had that put in the middle to make another necklace for herself. Diana's quite clever with her jewels. She actually mounted the choker on a piece of Velcro and of course the first time she did that was when she took Queen Mary's emerald necklace on her Australian tour of 1985 and then she had it round her head like a squaw's headband again on this Velcro base. That emerald necklace was part of Queen Mary's inheritance, and really that's the beginning of Diana getting some of the royal jewels. She also, of course, had the fantastic tiara from the Queen, pearls and diamonds and lover's knots, really a very pretty piece. But Diana now is getting a lot of things given to her as gifts. It's surprising how few jewels Diana's had from the royal family. The Queen Mother gave her a very beautiful, enormous sapphire, as big as a duck's egg, and uh, it was a brooch, and Diana, of course, never wears brooches, so she had that mounted on a choker, on a multi-strand pearl choker, and she wears it looking very flamboyant and important. But otherwise, the gifts have mainly been from heads of state. She had an Indian necklace given to her by the um, King of Jordan, another very colorful piece with turquoises and other stones in. And, of course, the gifts from the Arabs are the ones that really are the most extraordinary. There are really two sides to Diana's jewels. There are the big grand pieces that she wears on the state occasions, but there are also the personal trinkets, the kind of things that Charles gives her. You know, she's got a charm bracelet, and uh, when they came back from Australia the first time, he gave her a little gold koala bear to hang on it. She's got a lot of little personal mementos like that. Charles also gave her a medallion with um, William written on it in his own writing to celebrate the birth of their son. She likes those personal pieces. She bought herself a diamond heart, which she wears like a locket round her neck. So she rarely mixes those things in with these very grand pieces that, of course, are preparation for when she's going to be the Queen of England in all the royal jewels. 
Diana, of course, has borrowed jewels from the Queen. She's managed to get her hands on her mother-in-law's jewel case. And when she did her first tour of Australia, when she didn't have many jewels to choose from, she borrowed a choker from the Queen and the Queen's pearl and diamond earrings. I think now she's probably got enough of her own. It's impossible to imagine how much jewellery there is there in the royal collection. Queen Mary, whose emerald necklace Diana wears, had an absolute mass of jewels, every possible stone and style. Most of those went to her granddaughter, the Queen, and the Queen hasn't passed on many of them yet. But Diana, when she's Queen, will have all the crown jewellery and also a lot of personal pieces that have been amassed. Any stone she wants, rubies, amethysts, diamonds, emeralds, every colour and every size of stone, from little tiny ones to great big clonkers, are out there for her to wear. Now let's take our monthly look at what the papers say. Here's Michael again. The big story that just wouldn't go away, of course, day after day, week in, week out, concerned Charles and Di, the Prince and Princess of Wales. All over Europe, and especially in France and Germany, magazines and newspapers wanted to know, were they heading for divorce, or were their much-publicised separations blown up out of all proportion? In Britain, it wasn't only the popular papers who were making hay with what today called the soap opera antics seriously damaging the monarchy. The heavyweight Sunday Times claimed to know the facts, don't they all? But at least its facts were supported by a poll showing that the monarchy had lost some public popularity. Cartoonists like Jack in the Daily Mail made the most of the Charles and Di separations with a proclamation at Buckingham Palace that they'd breakfasted together. The Sun went so far as to speculate on what might happen to the princes, William and Harry. Unthinkable that Charles and Di should split, it said, and then had it both ways by saying that the unthinkable keeps happening in the royal family. Today reported yet another sensation caused by the royal rift, uproar in the Commons over a Tory MP's suggestion that Prince Charles might not be fit to succeed to the throne. In the Mirror, James Whitaker heralded the tour of Germany as a time for tenderness, the most testing week of their married lives. And he added, in countries all over the globe, People are just as interested in the health of the royal marriage as we are in Britain. And they're deeply worried by what they've been seeing lately. For my money, the cruelest aspect of all the publicity was the way Lady Tryon, otherwise known as Kanga, of course, was subjected to gossip about the split. Oh yes, certainly the son printed a denial by her husband that she was having an affair with Charles, thereby spreading the gossip further, of course. But look at what the star did to her. Delving deeply into its photo files for the most unflattering picture possible, it asked, is it even remotely possible that Charles would creep off to her bed in secret? The Daily Express columnist, Jean Rook, concentrated on the galling experience for the Queen having to watch Charles die and some of the rest of the family behaving as they have been doing recently. She daily says her prayers and rings her mother. Today, she must be asking God and the Queen Mum what she's done to merit the selfish, squabbling, irresponsible lot she has to face. But if the Queen has problems in Britain, what must that other royal parent, Prince Rainier of Monaco, be thinking? The Daily Mirror produced an exclusive interview with the man it described as Princess Stephanie's beach bum lover. The paper said Stephanie was breaking her father's heart with Mario, the social climber who'd thrown out this blatant challenge. If we can't marry, he told the Mirror, then we will have a baby. After all that, the Windsor family's problems seem tame indeed. And anyway, if the Express is to be believed, happy days are here again for Charlie and his darling. Among the royal events of the last few weeks was one in the royal borough of Windsor that we've waited 300 years for. 
the tercentenary of the Guildhall, designed by the great Christopher Wren and still used every day by the local councillors and civic leaders. At a dinner to celebrate, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, was in a waggish mood. Your Worship, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need take a vote among your guests uh, to assure you of our uh, pleasure at being here this evening and how much we appreciate your invitation to take part in this celebration in this famous and much loved Guild Hall. Uh, speaking for myself, I'm just totting it up. I'm a fishmonger and a shipwright of London. <laughs> it's, it's, it, when it gets a bit later, it tends to become a, a shipmonger and a fishwright. <laughs> The Princess Royal was at the Barbican in the heart of the City of London, speaking at the annual general meeting of Save the Children Fund, of which, as all the world knows, she is president. Ladies and gentlemen, well, if you've read your programme, you will realise that I am the good news and the bad news. The bad news is that you've got to listen to me, and you've heard most of it already. And the good news is that the end is in sight. <laughs> we do have a nine million pound fall in overall income in 1986-87, which is the first time for many years that income has dropped substantially. But that is, well, call it what you like, call it compassion fatigue, call it overexposure. The drop is really explicable in terms of the unprecedented public response to the East African famine of 1984, which lasted through to 1986. As you return to your various parts of the country, please be assured that you are not alone. You're not underestimated or undervalued. We all share, to some degree, the aim of giving children the best possible start in life. To achieve that, we all need to be partners for progress. back on what might be called domestic duties after her involvement in global affairs in the Commonwealth, opened a new airport. It's the London City Terminal in the Royal Docks. Her presence seemed to signify the re-emergence of an area that's been in decay for many years as a revived center of commercial growth and enterprise. While much of that was going on in Britain, Nigel Dempster was busy digging for golden nuggets of gossip in Australia. And as usual, he struck it rich. When Charles and Diana made an official visit to Portugal earlier this year, their thoughtful hosts gave them separate bedrooms and not, as they'd asked for, separate bathrooms. This gave rise to all the speculation and rumour that the couple weren't getting on well together and, in fact, at Kensington Palace had separate bedrooms. That's not true, of course. There is only one bedroom at Kensington Palace, but they do have separate bathrooms. And I've just learned that for their visit for the bicentennial early next year to Australia, there have been very precise orders sent out to their hosts that on all occasions, to stop any such rumour ever starting again, that Charles and Diana must be put in the same bedroom in the same king-sized giant bed. And, of course, next year is the year that everyone thinks that the royal reconciliation will be made final by the arrival of the much longed-for daughter that Charles and Diana have been telling everyone for the last two or three years that they want to complement and perhaps make up their family. And I just get the feeling that in that king-sized double bed, somewhere down under, under the duvet, an Australian royal baby will be made. Of all the perks that wealth brings to royalty, one of the most enviable must be the possession of great works of art. On the walls of many palaces hang oils and watercolours of masters down the ages. But now we unveil something very different. The art, although I'm not sure you can always call it that, of the royals themselves. We do so courtesy of Jane Roberts, curator of the print room at Windsor Castle, who has just published a book called Royal Artists, which catalogues the works of generations of Windsors, Hanoverians, and Stuarts. Florence has featured notably in royal painting. It's exactly 100 years since Queen Victoria made this study of the city's skyline during a visit to Italy. 
Even before that, her daughter, Princess Louise, on honeymoon in Florence, painted this rooftop's view. The future Queen Mary lived in Florence with her parents and brothers. And this view is from the north side of the Ponte Vecchio. Most recently, just a couple of years ago in fact, Prince Charles painted this watercolor featuring the varying shades of terracotta roof tiles. Queen Victoria's considerable output included this view of her six eldest children. A Scottish landscape along the Dee, painted at the time she acquired the Balmoral estate. A pastel of a servant of Balmoral. This was in 1851. And the birthplace of her husband in Coburg. Most intimate of all, perhaps, is this view of the Queen breakfasting privately in Windsor Castle. The artist is the Duke of Edinburgh. The Duke also painted this picture of fishermen's huts with a jetty during a visit to Malaysia in 1975. Princess Margaret in the 1960s composed a number of flower pieces like this from the feathers of pheasant, partridges, and other birds. Prince Charles produced this watercolor of Petra during a visit to Jordan in March 1985. And from the Royal Yacht Britannia last year, passing by the island of Skye. Finally in this edition, come with me to an obviously upper crust but nevertheless quite modest establishment in London's Belgravia to meet Ian Thomas, the man who has inherited Norman Hartnell's role as the Queen's personal dress designer. Does the Queen respond to your ideas or are you responding to her ideas, her feelings well, about how she should Well, naturally, I mean, I'm a businessman. I take, a I take along things that I know she's going to like because if, if um, she doesn't like a thing, she's obviously not going to order it. And uh, very often there's a fabric perhaps that, that she likes, that I don't like, and that I try to hide. But she's got a marvellous memory and remembers it, of course, and asks me where it is. But um, very often we're pretty well attuned and, and get the thing going together. Does the Queen ever look at the sketches and say, no, I don't like that neckline? Oh, Can very she? often. I mean, she is, she's got her own ideas about fashion and how she wants to look. And uh, obviously she's not that interested in very high fashion because her clothes have to go on for years. I mean, she still goes on wearing dresses that she likes for perhaps two, three, four, five years. There's one that I think everybody remembers, which is uh, the dress she wore for the Duke and Duchess of York's wedding, which was very, very different, I think. Well, that was quite easily ordered, actually. I mean, it was quite a simple job to get her to order that. But um, it's quite a different look for her, perhaps. And it was so nice that we were able to introduce a large hat to the ensemble. And it makes quite a change because normally we make small hats for the Queen because getting in and out of cars becomes quite difficult if you have a large hat on. But I mean, in this particular instance, she knew she was sitting in an open carriage, so it was all all right. But one problem you must have when you're designing for her is that the clothes have to be seen from every angle, by, by the human eye, often by the television camera. Mm -hmm. So there are well, many, many considerations. Well, I think I was given a good grounding in that sort of, in that, in that way, in that, um, uh, I worked with Norman Hartnell for many years, who was a very theatrical designer, and he knew all about royal dressing and, and uh, you know, how a thing should look under television lights or this, that and the other. And he, he gave me a great grounding in colour and, and theatrical clothes, I suppose. And uh, I have to take all those things into consideration when we start designing. Well, I wonder how much um, a dress like this would cost. I mean, if I was to come in here and buy one of your dresses from your collection, how much would I pay, say, for well, a day Well, the Queen job? pays um, what my customers pay. And my customers pay from four to five hundred for a day dress, and perhaps um, six, seven hundred for an evening dress, depending how elaborate it is. I mean, if it's a very embroidered dress, they pay a few hundred pounds more. 
Does the Queen enjoy her clothes? I think she does, really. Um, you know, very often she sort of prays up and down in them and you feel, ah, success. <laughs> And she keeps them for a long time. Does she have oh, favourites? Very, very often. I mean, it's nice to know that she does go on wearing them for a long time. And they do come in occasionally to be, to be, for want of a better word, tarted up a little. A hem altered or That's right. a shoulder mm. pad put in or not, something? Not altered, but, uh, you know, if she tears a hemline or, or does something to a sleeve, then perhaps it's righted here. And that's all from Royal Watch this month. Do join us next time for more inside stories of royalty at work and play. Goodbye. Bellamy becomes involved in cleaning up a prostitution racket next on 10 and he takes it upon himself to protect a 16-year-old runaway who's become the victim of a ruthless procurer. Bellamy, that's just ahead, so don't go away.